All right, welcome to our uh, next edition of the uh, educational webinars from Brian Tell Medicine and Telltime Health. Today we have with us Dr. Michael Aronson from Lincoln Nephrology and Hypertension, as well as Dr. Bryce Lund from Nephrology Care uh, in Fremont. So pleased to have them here with us today. Um, I will continue to let folks in as they arrive. But uh, Dr. Aronson, if you would like to introduce yourself, and then I'll have Dr. Lund introduce himself, and then you can start with your uh, section of the presentation. Okay, great. So hi, everybody. So I'm Michael Aronson. I'm a nephrologist, and I'm out of Lincoln. And today we're going to do some case studies for you. Dr. Lund? Yes. Yeah, I'm Bryce Lund. Uh, with nephrology also based out of Fremont, and uh, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, kidney failure. Dr. Aronson, take it away. Okay, so the first case. <clears throat> so this is a patient that many of us have seen, and it starts with a 77-year-old male who's admitted to the cardiac ICU for acute exacerbation of congestive heart failure. So what kind of heart failure? It turns out that this person's gonna have a reduced ejection fraction and a history of ischemic cardiomyopathy. So his EF is 35%, which will make a difference in terms of how we're gonna treat this patient. He also has type two diabetes, high blood pressure, the bold is what matters, and chronic gastritis and depression. He also has a 15 pack year smoking history, but he quit five years ago. And that'll become important as we go through some of our objectives and his acid base. He has occasional alcohol, but no recreational drug use. And without giving the doses, he's on insulin, amlodipine, bumetanide. That was the um, loop diuretic of choice that the prescriber had him on, lisinopril and carvedilol. Okay, so physical exam. We're going to paint a picture of fluid overload here. So the blood pressure is 138 over 84. So I would argue that um, although that's a pretty okay blood pressure, someone who's admitted has fluid overload and an ejection fraction of 35%, maybe that's a little higher than we want it. The heart rate's 84 and the temperature is 37. He's got jugular venous distension. It's nine centimeters above the sternal angle. He's got coarse breath sounds and he has crackles. And he has an S3 gallop and two plus pitting edema with uh, peripheral pulses that they know. So they go ahead and they prescribe IV bumetanide. And urine output increases and there's an improvement in the patient's breathing as we decongest him and the symptoms of orthopnea improve over the next few days. So perfect. So is everything better? Well, here are the laboratory data that we see. So you'll see here, here's day one and here's day four, and this is the panel. And so with that change from the oral to the IV diuretic, the potassium is gonna go down. So we can probably expect that. The creatinine of note, and notice, so we're a nephrologist, and you normally, oh, we're going to focus on their kidney function. So it gave everything else. The creatinine goes from 1.4 down to 0 0.6. So why is that? Would we expect that to get worse if we're going to give IV diuretics? And the answer is, he's going to end up having what's called cardiorenal syndrome. So he's full of fluid. There's some backup of the because of the um, extra fluid there, when we decompress them, the, cre the creatinine gets better. So that's actually going to be important later when I give you the question. Um, and then also of note, look at what happens to his CO2 here. He goes from 28 up to 38. And he's had lots, liters and liters of urine out. So he's contracted. He probably has a contraction alkalosis. Fluoride went from 108 to 88, and his BNP went from 800 to 450 just to go along with this cardiorenal. And he is alkalotic. Notice that his pH is 7.5. The PCO2 is 50, so with an active history, he probably has a history of COPD there, and then the PAO2 is 88. Okay, the question for everybody, which one of the following is the best next step to manage the metabolic alkalosis? Do you want to do spironolactone? Do you want to stop 
the bumetanide. And this is all for good fun because I don't say whether to stop the IV bumetanide and switch to oral, but number two, do we want to give ammonium chloride? That's going to be wrong because that's acid. And so this is not a test tube. Do we want to stop what we're doing and give normal saline or do we want to give acetazolamide? So those are the current options. And so everybody just take a second and think what you might choose in this situation. Now, if we had an audience response, what most people would do here is, I think most people would say, is they would say that acetazolamide is the choice. And it's going to turn out that I would offer that spironolactone is probably a better choice than giving acetazolamide. So the next, and I'll tell you why, the next best step in managing this patient with an acute exacerbation of CHF a low potassium and a metabolic alkalosis is to prescribe spironolactone over acetazolamide. So let's go through why that might be. So what happened in this situation is the patient was aggressively diuresed using loop diuretics IV in the hospital to take care of the heart failure. And by using the loop diuretic, that um, creates a situation where there's more fluid and salt being presented to the distal nephron. And when that gets presented to the cortical collecting duct, that leads to a situation of secondary hyperaldosteronism. So more sodium, more water, that's what you want. And then the kidney ramps up and sodium goes in and hydrogen goes out, which is basically causing the alkalosis and so does potassium. So that's where we get the secondary hyperaldosteronism. It's all about flow. And so this is maintained by continuing the diuretics and you get a hypochloremia and volume contraction. So just going back here, notice how the chloride went from 108 down to 88, the CO2 went up, the potassium went down, everything that we would expect. So why spironolactone and not acetazolamide? So this is where I think the 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 finesse comes in. It's not that acetazolamide would be wrong, but it's not the best choice because when we look at heart failure and when we look at goal-directed medical therapy, in the short term and the long term, we're going to want to get these people on spironolactone if we can. And if it helps the overall situation in the acute setting, that would be preferred. So spironolactone is an aldosterone antagonist and that will break that cycle. And it'll spare the potassium, so we'll improve the potassium in this situation. If you block at that receptor, what you'll see is, is you'll see that the potassium will get better and the alkalosis because we won't allow the potassium to go in, sorry, the sodium to go in and the potassium and the hydrogen to go out. And you'll also get some diuretic effect. If a person can't tolerate um, spironolactone, then what um, you can consider is a plarinone. Okay. Let's just go back here to this case because I want to just focus on this. Spironolactone can lower blood pressure. It's very good at that. Well, our patient, like we talked about before, has a blood pressure that I think would tolerate spironolactone. So 138 over 84, so that will help. And then also here, it'll help the potassium and then also the CO2. Okay. Okay. Cetazolamide. How that works is it works proximally, and it basically creates a sort of renal tubular acidosis where it prevents bicarbonate reabsorption proximally. The problem with this is this will end up causing worsening hypokalemia, and it'll increase more delivery of sodium to the distal nephron, and then you'll have to give potassium. So you can get farther doing this other approach. Um, other choices that I would argue could be incorrect would be normal saline. If we're trying to diurese somebody, giving them some normal saline will put them right back where they were. So I don't think it would be the best option for this patient who has decompensated heart failure and needs diuretics. We talked about ammonium chloride, um, and that's never used. Um, that can improve the metabolic acidosis, but it's not going to address the diuretic uh, need or the low potassium, and then stopping bumetanide 
um, would create a problem because of hypoxia and volume overload. Okay, so that is my case. Let me stop the share and transfer it on to Dr. Lund. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Aronson. Dr. Lund, you want to share your screen and we will let you take it away. <clears throat> well, let me get through just a few of the slides here. Okay. So yes, uh, we're, we're going to go over a case of renal failure. And uh, this is our, our individual who presented. It was a 58-year-old. Uh, didn't have a lot of complaints, but wasn't feeling well, a little lightheaded, noticed more swelling on the legs, uh, did have a history of diabetes, high blood pressure, and also some kidney damage, CKD 3A, uh, creatinine usually around 1.8. I uh, recently had trouble with cellulitis on his leg and was started on Bactrim about a week ago, and it was during the last week he had not been feeling very well. Uh, his a little bit about his past, including medications, taking amlodipine, lisinopril, metformin, uh, dapagliflozin. Uh, vitals, blood pressure a little lower than what's typical for him. Uh, physical exam, not all that remarkable. Uh, didn't look all that distressed. Uh, he did have the swelling on the lower extremities, but lungs were clear and he was breathing on room air. So doing reasonably well from that standpoint. And then the, the more notable was when he had his lab checked. Uh, he had quite a few changes here. He had a little bit of low sodium level, elevated potassium level, 6.2, bicarbonate a little low, creatinine 6.5. And then uh, a few things that are going to help us out down the road here is one, his urine, which things to notice here would be not much for protein and no blood in the urine, so not very active. And then his EKG uh, showed sinus rhythm and he didn't have any ST changes. So that's kind of the, the initial findings for this individual. He was, he was actually at uh, an, a kind of an outreach uh, hospital and uh, he was admitted there. And then uh, the next step was what to do with his acute kidney injury. Was it gonna be managed locally or not? Uh, this was one of these cases we were able to help out with uh, telemedicine and got involved that way. And I thought this might be a, a little bit of a good case where we consider some of the management issues for what happens with uh, acute kidney injury or renal failure. Uh, some of those considerations we have listed here uh, it was kind of the mnemonic I initially learned, which was the vowels, the AEIOU, the acidosis, the electrolytes, intoxications, overload and uremia. And uh, we're, we're just gonna cover those a little bit. So these are the ones we're, we're kind of thinking about anytime we're considering what to do next. Uh, might they need dialysis? Might they need nephrology or, or, or possibly transferred to nephrology? So acidosis, uh, one of the things we consider uh, when it comes to dialysis, and there's some treatments we have, of course, you know, usually we're considering treatment if the pH is less than 7.2, and, and we didn't include all the information on this case, uh, but that would be something that we'd be checking. A couple ways to treat that. Uh, one would be uh, bicarbonate, either bolus or infusion. Uh, bolus is usually given kind of a slow push, maybe 15, 20 minutes. Uh, there is some concern uh, pushing those too fast can affect uh, calcium levels, uh, pH, sometimes arrhythmia concerns. So I'd like to do that slowly. If possible, a lot of times it's nice to give it as a continuous infusion. You can put three amps of bicarbonate with D5 and, and essentially run it at typical IV fluid speeds, which is a nice way to correct that. Uh, electrolytes, part of our considerations. You know, occasionally you do get sodium and uh, calcium phosphorus, more mineral changes. Uh, they tend not to be the predominant ones we have to deal with, like in this case where potassium is elevated. Uh, we do use the, the insulin and glucose, which has been pretty much a standard of care for a long time, and albuterol. And the thing to remember here is those are only shifting your potassium into cells, and you're not getting it out of the body. So you do want to kind of think about more of a, a plan to get that potassium removed. And then we can always use fluids and sometimes Lasix if it's helpful. 
even in this case, uh, sometimes there's the concern if a creatinine's quite elevated, should you use Lasix with that? But if they're making urine, often very helpful to do that. And then uh, treating with bicarbonate, uh, that can help lower your potassium level too, but really dependent if you've got a significantly low potassium level, if you're, or significantly low bicarbonate level, excuse me. Uh, if your bicarbonate level is normal, that tends not to have a lot of effect. Uh, a couple other considerations for potassium. Uh, we're now tending to use Lokelma or Veltassa a little bit more uh, instead of KX late. KX late's had a little bit of the concern of intestinal necrosis. Uh, and Lokelma and Veltassa, uh, more actually studied, indicated for chronic hyperkalemia, but do work for the acute. Uh, and some things to think about there, Lokelma uh, comes with some sodium in it, so you have to be a little concerned long-term about sodium loads and Veltassa sometimes can lower magnesium levels. Uh, intoxications, uh, things to think about. In our case, this gentleman was on metformin. Could this be uh, lactic acidosis from that? And uh, again, we're not, not putting up all the details of his case, uh, but you certainly want to check a lactic acid level and uh, metformin lactic acidosis, usually when that is the case, it's a very severe acidosis. Uh, I think the last one we had, uh, the lactic acid was around 22 and, and uh, the patient presented almost like sepsis, uh, had a couple dialysis treatments and, and made quite a bit of difference for uh, turning that around. A couple other ones just to remember off the top of your head, other indications for dialysis with medicines, lithium, aspirin, uh, ethylene glycol and methanol, each kind of individually dealt with, but uh, can be treated with dialysis as necessary. And then uh, the last of our vowels here, overload fluid management. Of course, if you're having troubles with oxygenation or, or you know, severe shortness of breath is a good indication for dialysis. And then uh, uremia, which is more of a uh, kind of a chronic concern. Uh, folks do get fatigue with renal failure, uh, but typically does not cause too much trouble in the acute setting. And mental status changes are pretty unusual, uh, even with severe renal failure. Uh, I remember in training, we had uh, a gentleman we referred to as Mr. 46.3, and that was because that was the level of his creatinine when he walked in the door. And although he was super tired, he was able to converse and make sense. And and, it, and uh, they tend not to have true mental status changes. Can't have trouble with itching and nausea and sometimes pleural effusions, which would be a, a indication for dialysis. But again, dialysis does not help kidneys recover, but just helps us manage some of these complications that uh, we're talking about here. So outcome of this patient, uh, he really didn't have any absolute indications for dialysis. Uh, he was taken care of through our telemedicine program and did a bit of discussion with uh, staff and family and they were fine with uh, doing conservative treatment. So the way we approached it, of course, stopping lisinopril, Bactrim, his dapagliflozin also held. Uh, here we were fortunate, he did have pretty good urine output in the first day. So we were, were able to make some progress. We did give some Lasix and even some fluids. It, it did appear he was a little volume depleted and his potassium just continued to trend down. Uh, creatinine got a little bit worse. Uh, you know, sometimes that can happen with uh, using Lasix, but if it helps control your potassium, probably well worth it. And essentially just talked with, you know, family and staff. Sometimes uh, they hear things like, well, you know, good thing you got in with you did. If that potassium was any higher, it could have, you know, gave you a heart attack or made your heart stop. And so sometimes they need a little discussion about uh, how much risk there is for needing treatments or dialysis and, and just manage those expectations. So uh, just kind of in summary here, uh, many variations of acute kidney injury and creatinine level, not always a good predictor of ability to recover. I've always been surprised. Sometimes individuals, creatinines of 11, 17, uh, take away the wrong medicine or a Foley catheter gets put in. And sometimes that creatinine is almost back to normal in a few days. Uh, in our case, urine output, a very determining factor. If you've got someone who's anuric or not making 
any urine, that would definitely change this case we're talking about. You would almost certainly need to move them on to considering dialysis. And, and how active the UA is, you know, if they've got a lot of protein or blood in the urine, you're going to be more concerned about uh, kidneys not being able to recover very well. So in general, I guess I'd say those are the, the complications we think about. Some of the treatments can be used uh, conservatively and sometimes uh, helping out even remotely by telemedicine if di dialysis is not needed. And that is the end of this case. Well, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Lund. Um, so a couple of questions that I have from a non-clinical perspective, and I'm going to ask other folks if they have questions, put them in the chat and I will get them read. So both of you brought cases forward that um, were had some diabetic uh, complications going on. Can you speak a little bit about uh, diabetes and, and kidney kidney challenges? Well, I, I certainly can cover a little bit of that. There's a lot of challenges with that. Uh, uh, I'm sure as Dr. Aronson would agree, uh, diabetes is the leading cause of kidney damage. Uh, the most common thing I'll be seeing in, in patients who are having uh, kidney issues. So uh, yes, we always have a higher uh, index of suspicion, looking for, you know, worsening kidney function or albumin in the diabetics. And also these individuals are at higher risk for developing complications like acute kidney injury. The case I presented, you know, Bactrim, pretty well known to bother kidneys, especially individuals with CKD or diabetes. So yeah, if you've got that diabetic with not good kidney function, you have to start worrying about those sort of things like staying away from certain medications and uh, and uh, watching their kidney function closely. Sure. Dr. Aronson, any other comments on that? No, I think that really covers it well. Perfect. Thank you. Dr. Lund, you did reference telemedicine. Um, I know you do a number of sites. What's kind of what's your dividing line between, you know, what you might be comfortable with managing over a telemedicine connection and what you might be thinking, oh, this this person probably needs to go to a higher level of care. Sure, sure. It's really that initial presentation, how ill or sick they are. If, if they've got the, you know, the troubles with low blood pressures, requiring pressors, uh, the poor or no urine output, uh, and we don't have a cause that's easy to turn around, uh, it's really that first presentation, the first 12, 24 hours, uh, if they're not doing well, even at the start, they're probably going to need to go to basically a higher level of care. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions out there? I don't have any in the chat right now, but we'll give everybody a minute. Anything else, any other comments, either of what one of you would like to make on the cases or anything like that? Well, I, I might make just a, a, a little comment. Uh, I, I liked what Dr. Aronson was covering with the diuretics and I think there is quite a bit of finesse in using the right diuretics. And, and one of the things he mentioned was the Bumex and, you know, I, I tend to see lots of variation where you're using Bumex or Lasix or Torsemide. And in general, my opinion has been they're all good diuretics and you can get a response from any of them. But I, I tend to use when you're really kind of up against the wall and you're needing a diuretic effect, no matter which one you're using, I tend to move over to twice daily dosing since none of them are, are very long acting diuretics. Uh, and, and of course, not everyone's going to need that if they don't have, you know, bad kidney function or severe edema. But sure. that's one of the thoughts that tends to help folks out. And and Dr. Erdson, if you've got tricks or if that's something you uh, have used in the past, I'd be interested to hear your experience. I think that's a really good point. And what, we're going to do more of these. And I think what we should consider doing is maybe having a little case study on just diuretics and management, and they really are very similar. It just depends on the particular case and, and the dose equivalent. So I think it's 120-40, so 
bumetanide is one milligram, which is equivalent to um, 20 of torsamide and then 40 of furosemide. And particular diuretic in one may work better in another and trying. And I feel that that's where we can come in because we just do this all day long. And that that's a really good point. We should consider doing that because it's in it, using them together and which ones work and what situation. So I've done that myself too, where we're increasing the dose versus switching to another can work. One thing I've found is persons tried a diuretic and they've gone to, let's say, cardiology and cardiology switched it. Not because the first one didn't work, but they're trying just maybe something different to see if that'll work. And the patient thinks they're allergic to, let's say, Lasix. They're on Lasix and they're switched to torsamide. And they come in like, oh, you're going to give me IV. I can't take that. And, you know, yes, you can. And it's very possible that in that first case, that's what was going on here. So... Right, right. Yeah, totally agree. The other thought I might put on that too, all of our patients that have the trouble with fluid overload, I think we tend to kind of overlook some of the basics like talking to them about salt and also fluid restriction, uh, yeah. especially those that are really hard to control. Often find they still get the device, push a lot of fluids. And, you know, if it's hard to diurese them, you, you, they really should not be out there drinking you know, two, three liters a day, you do have to talk to them about, you know, getting down, uh, cutting back a bit on their fluids. So you're not having to work so hard with the diuretics. One thing that I've found, and I don't know if you've seen this a lot with the telehealth is sometimes we can be a value where let's say the hospitalist is thinking one way and the cardiologist is another way. We can be a fresh pair of eyes and give another perspective, especially with volume management and electrolytes. I feel like we've helped out many times in that circumstance where one person thinks dry, the other thinks wet. And because we do this all day long, it, it's just another perspective that I think can help the person. That's a really good mm -hmm. point. Okay. How about any thoughts, you know, genetic tendencies, genetic components to kidney disease? Yeah, I, I, I probably would uh, touch on that. That's a great topic because, of course, genetics are getting into everything these days, including uh, kidney disease, kidney treatments. And and within the last several years, we now have a, a kidney panel, a genetic panel, which can be obtained and is very helpful now. I, I do tend to use it a fair bit. Uh, of course, you're talking about individuals where you have a high index suspicion about a family history, maybe. Uh, or findings that do look like genetic kidney damage, but we're able to run this genetic test now, which is is quite helpful for them. Um, it, it's really more when you're thinking about the chronic kidney disease patient, kind of outpatient initial evaluation or monitoring where that uh, comes into being helpful is, is what I would uh, think about. All right, we have a question, and I will try not to butcher the names of the medications. <laughs> the question is, speaking of spir spironolactone and resistant hypertension, I find myself sometimes adding spironolactone to a hypertensive regimen as opposed to checking aldosterone alde and, and renin activity first. How do you go about sorting out who needs a diagnostic workup versus just empiric treatment with spironolactone. So that's a really, that's a really good question. Um, what I tend to do is it depends on the number of medicines they're on and their electrolytes and their overall picture. So I'm not ordering a ton of aldo renin ratios, but if, if the clinical picture does look right, let's say the potassium is low, they're not on a diuretic, the bicarb is elevated and their blood pressure is significantly high on multiple meds, and that would be something to consider. But I'm doing that too for patients who have um, resistant hypertension. I've gone down that rabbit hole multiple times, and I know that in the literature they say that there's all this secondary hyper uh, aldosteronism, but I just haven't seen enough of it so that we're taking out people's adrenal glands left and right. And the other thing is, is if you're going to, 
there's for diagnosis and then there's also what are we going to do about it and there's different criteria to consider whether or not you're going to go forward and do something about it so um, if you're if you're doing a workup and maybe a younger person but if someone's old they're not going to tolerate the surgery it may just be worth going ahead and doing the spironolactone back in the day every patient got every one of those tests every time they got the renal artery uh, dopplers they got the cortisol test and i think what we were doing was adding a tremendous amount of expense so but if you have somebody who is very resistant on multiple meds including a diuretic um, and you're worried about it then it would be worth getting that test and then going further but that's just what I'm finding around here. What do you think, Dr. Lund? Maybe I totally agree. I, I, I think kind of where the question was uh, also leading a bit was, you know, how easily should you use spironolactone? And I, I think the key is, is that, you know, it works as a blood pressure medicine. You don't have to have hyperaldo to have a good response to spironolactone. So uh, I have many folks who come in and that seems to add as much or more benefit than you know, the other one or two meds they started on before that. So, yeah, just like I think Dr. Ariston was saying, if, you know, if you've got that younger middle-aged person who just develops refractory high blood pressure, low K levels, you know, you're going to work that person up. Yeah. But, you know, if you've got someone that's, you know, say, 60s, other health troubles, they've had high blood pressure for quite a while, it can just be a good medicine just to help with blood pressure. Very good. Another question. Uh, for patients who have had a history of COVID and now are having an increased trend in blood pressure, would you recommend um, getting a specialty consult on those folks? I mean, yeah. I'm all about getting, if there's ever a concern, I, I am always about getting a consult because that means that a, a person needs help. And if there's a trouble managing the blood pressure and we can help even if it's a one and done, then... Mm -hmm. We're all about that. I'm just interested in why specifically COVID. Yeah, because I yeah. mean, th th that happens all the time. <laughs> There's just for whatever reason, and a person may be racking their brain, and there's all these different uh, reasons why a particular therapy or, or treatment regimen isn't working. Sure. And uh, sometimes that quick intervention, even if it's a one and done, can really be beneficial is what I've found. And I, I don't know whether it's, oh, I have to go to the specialist. Maybe I need to take this seriously now. That's possible. Mm -hmm. Or if, you know, maybe there's something that's missed, then we can, you know, help yeah. and try to help figure that out. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. <clears throat> uh, when it comes to COVID, uh, we do know that there's a connection between COVID and uh, episodes of acute kidney injury, but of course that's just during the acute illness. Sure. Uh, and, and there's a couple mechanisms that cause that to happen, but long-term we really don't see any COVID related kidney troubles or say direct blood pressure issues. Uh, so yeah, I, I totally agree. It would come down just to the refractory nature of the blood pressure. Sure. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, put them in the chat. We'll give everybody just a minute here. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Aarons and Dr. Lund. This has been very, very interesting. Uh, appreciate the review of these cases. Uh, looking forward to doing more of this in the future with you guys. This has been really, really great. Uh, Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yes. Thanks Thank for you. Locking out some time. Uh, looking forward to another uh, educational webinar, November the 8th. Uh, we'll have five nines come and talk to us about some cybersecurity thoughts that they have. So uh, look for more information about that coming soon. But thank you, everybody, for joining. Thank you, Dr. Lon, Dr. Aronson. Um, this has been great. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you.